All right, welcome to the Excel virtual chapter uh, monthly or new meeting of the 2015 uh, season and year. Here's some community news about um, PASS itself. There are many virtual chapters. If you go to sqlpass.org, you can get a listing of all the virtual chapters, even some of the global ones. There are many, many to choose from with meetings going on multiple multiple times a month. Um, upcoming in January, here's the list of the DBA fundamentals, BI, disaster recovery, analytics, and others that are having presentations. Again, you can see all these meetings listed on the sqlpass.org website under the virtual chapter menu choice. Upcoming, um, everybody's excited about the business analytics conference. This is, I believe, the third one. It's in Santa Clara. California. Go to PassBAConference.com if you're interested in learning or growing in the business analytics space. Um, SQL Rally is going to be in Copenhagen March 2nd through the 14th. they got an international speaker including Mr. SQL Server, Sean Bice. Um, you can get a 5% off your registration with the code PASSCHAPTERS5. Um, please go to the SQL Rally site to register for that. Uh, upcoming SQL Saturdays, these are free events on your Saturday. You have to give up your Saturday, but there are, uh, they are free of admission. Nashville, Austin, I'll actually be in Austin in about a week. Cleveland, Albuquerque, Tampa, and Phoenix, and even internationally in Israel, El Salvador, Melbourne, Melbourne Vienna, and Port Dinon. Um, and you can also volunteer. Uh, that's what I've done to get involved with the past community. Um, to become uh, a member of PASS, it's free, and then you go to the volunteer.sqlpass.org site. There's a My Volunteering section uh, of your profile where you can uh, register uh, for different um, volunteering opportunities. And we have the PASS Volunteer Award. It's an outstanding volunteer as well as a Passion Award. You can get nominate someone or vote for them. Go to the parts of the SQL Pass website for that, and please stay involved. Join with your favorite uh, social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, or LinkedIn for more information. All right, give me a second to flip slides. And we'll start the presentation. All right, so you're here watching Excel 2013 Tips and Tricks displaying a multi-dimensional uh, cube. Uh, my name is Thomas LeBlanc. I'm a data warehouse architect for a company in Baton Rouge called EQ Health Solutions. A little bit about me is uh, I am a data warehouse architect. Um, before then, people used to say I was a data normalization nut. Today, I think I'm a little crazy about dimensional modeling. I retired from being a developer about 12 years ago. Um, you can contact me in Twitter, blog, or Gmail. Uh, the nickname is The Smiling DBA. I also volunteer for many things in the past community, including, including the local Baton Rouge SQL Server user group as well as SQL Saturdays. So our agenda for today is uh, demo, demo, demo. We're going to try to demonstrate as much as we can in Excel. We're going to look at the pivot tables, some of the options for them. Um, filters, uh, report slicers, and timelines, uh, conditional formatting, including indicators, spark, li spark lines, and others. Uh, we're going to look at some charting, line bar, maybe a stack bar, and hopefully towards the end, if we have time, a complete dashboard. If you have a question, uh, when you ask it, um, Elizabeth is going to put it in the chat window for me, and I'm going to try to answer them as best I can during the demonstration, or you can wait till the end, and we should have about five minutes left at the end to answer any questions. So, to connect to a multi-dimensional cube, uh, the best thing to use is a pivot table. Uh, this is where you select the data. It uh, has areas for measures, which are the values in the pivot table, as well as the dimensions where you use the attributes and hierarchies for rows, columns, or even uh, for report filtering. The pivot table, actually you can change layouts. Um, there's a form, this is something I found out not too long ago, which was pretty neat, where you can go from tabular to compact to outline. 
and even while you're doing the uh, changes to the cube, there's an option to defer the layout update, which we'll take a look at. All right, so let's go ahead straight into the demos. I'm going to open an Excel spreadsheet. I hope everybody can see that fine. I might increase the uh, percentage a little just to make it a little easier to view. And we're going to connect from the data menu under, under other sources to uh, analysis services. It's on my local server, so I'm just putting a dot there for local. And it's my AdventureWorks cube. And we're actually going to work with the full cube, not a perspective. When I click Next, it's going to ask for a name. I could actually change the name in here if I wanted to. And it saves it as an ODC um, file, which can be placed on disk or even shared, uh, maybe through SharePoint or um, uh, other means, a network share. So when I, when I pick that, it's going to ask me, do I want to create a pivot table, a pivot chart, even launch Power View if we'd like, or only create the connection. We're first going to work with just a pivot table. So the first thing we're going to see, and I'm going to uh, unnormalize this, or unmaximize it just so I can point this out a little clearer to y'all. In the pivot table fields, one of the things that I like is there's a drop down here under show, show fields. And what you could do is you could actually pick the measure group from the multidimensional cube that you want to view. We're going to select cell summary, and what that does is instead of showing all measures and all dimensions, it's only going to show the ones available to me for that um, measure group, which, which helps uh, when you put a lot of things on the screen, it can become confusing. It also makes sure that dimensions that you're using in the pivot table are actually related um, to the measures in that measure group. Uh, I see this a lot where there's different facts and different dimensions that don't have a relationship to some uh, measure groups and the, the, the user pulls it out there and nothing happens or the, the value is the same and they get really confused. And when you confuse someone with uh, connecting to a multidimensional cube like that, sometimes they're reluctant to uh, do a lot of work in it. The other thing is you can change the way these are displayed. So if you wanted the columns up top with the drag areas below, you could do that. My favorite is just the one side by side like that. So we're going to first um, go and just kind of look around here. So in, in the pivot table fields, you're going to really see three sections. The first one has a summation, which is our measures. There's one if your cube has KPIs to list those. And then the last area is your dimension tables. We're going to go ahead and select for our first pivot table the sales amount, which is just a typical value, and it's going to you know, uh, do the intersection of all our dimensions and give us that amount. The next thing we're going to do is grab the calendar hierarchy, put it on our rows, and scroll down a little further and get product categories on our columns. So just that easy, we have created a pivot table with our multidimensional cube which has a good summary of categories of sales as well as the, the calendar year for those sales. If we wanted to at this point, we could uh, get inside the cube. In the upper right under the pivot tables menu, um, there, are, uh, there is a pivot chart. Since it's not fully displaying down, what I'm going to do is over in the bottom uh, right, there's a little uh, pin. Or I could pin that ribbon down, and now it's going to always be displayed. One of the first things in the far right is this area that says Show. And this is where you can get rid of the field list on your right, the plus minus signs in your pivot chart, as well as the field headers on the pivot table. If you saw me as I chose each one, those particular areas went away. It's just good for when you're displaying this in the end to be able to do that. So I'm going to click on pivot chart and in 2013 it's trying to suggest the best chart for you. It suggested picking a clustered column and we're just going to select that and you're going to see our chart um, related to our um, pivot table. I went ahead and got rid of the ribbon for just a second just so we could see this more displayed. So that's how easy it is to put a pivot table and a chart on our um, on our uh, display here in, uh, in a um, 
an Excel uh, spreadsheet. I'm going to go ahead and delete the chart and then I'm going to do some drill down. So one method is to hit the plus sign next to the year and it's going to drill down the hierarchy to um, the semester, then the quarter, then the month, and then the days in the month. So that's what the, the little plus is, is to drill up and down inside of that hierarchy. Now the, the calendar year, it, the calendar is a hierarchy, not an individual attribute. The same thing uh, we'll have with the uh, category. It'll go to subcategories, and then the subcategories actually go to the product itself. So when you build a hierarchy in analysis service, multidimensional cube, those are viewable. If we just wanted the category out there, I'm going to remove product categories from the columns, go to the product dimension under more fields, and I could just drag out category if I wanted. If I wanted subcategory under that as an individual attribute, I could do that too. But what you don't get is the automatic drill up, drill down uh, for that. I'm just going to hit Control Z a couple times and restore back to that first uh, pivot table we had and look at a couple of other things. Um, we can hide totals. So if I go to the grand total, um, column here, right click and remove grand total, it'll disappear. We also can do it from the design area where it shows subtotals and grand totals. And we have some option here to say all for row and columns, on for row and columns, just on for rows, or just on for columns, as well as subtotals. So let's drill in to a couple of these years and we'll see what that means. So in this display you have the subtotal on the top part of the hierarchy. Well if you go to design and subtotals you could tell it to go to the bottom. Now it's actually on the bottom with a, a new row rather than the top and then the top part has a little break in your report which I think is pretty cool. Now a couple other things, I'm just going to undo that real quick. A couple other options here also are is, is your report layout. So that we're looking at a compact form, but you also have an outline form, a tabular form, and some other options where you repeat all items on the label or you don't repeat all items on the label. So that's some pretty cool little tips and tricks for these. Again, I'm going to undo everything so I can go back to my original state and that is hiding the legends. Um, also, a new feature, since we have a highlighted item here, a little help comes up nowadays that is an explorer where you can actually drill into the different dimensions that it's related to. So from the pivot table itself now, there's a new explorer that lets you drill up and down into other dimensions and hierarchies that aren't placed on the pivot table at that time. It, be careful because when you do pick them, they are going to, um, it is going to change your display. One other feature in the bottom right, I'm going to try to zip this up for you again so you can see it. There's this little option down here called defer layout update. So say for instance, I didn't want the um, uh, calendar on the rows and the category on the columns. Uh, by deferring the layout update, I can move the column to the row, the row to the column, and then hit that update button in your bottom right, and it'll actually do the update for you. The reason you do this, if you have a large cube and you start moving dimensions around the rows, columns, and filters, it'll constantly run an OLAP query against your cube, which might you know slow things down. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, I see that frequently used in our uh, where I work now, they, the tool we use actually has the same sort of thing and the, the clients really love it. It's our analytical viewer and it works very, very well. So let's go back to the presentation. And that's our first demo. The, the screen thing you see up there too is part of the connection properties. A nice thing about building one of these um, Excel um, charts or dashboards is um, you could give it to somebody and they open it up and it displays. Overnight there might be a compile of data. When you originally connect, uh, create the connection, the refresh data when opening file is not enabled. So when you open it up, it has the current run 
from the last time you opened it up. So you would have to refresh all to get the most current data. If you check that little box there, you can see it in the center of the screen, refresh data when opening the file, it will automatically go to the, the cube and refresh the data. Just a, a handy little tip there. All right, so the next area we're going to look at is filtering. Uh, filtering, so we looked at data on our uh, pivot table, and now we want to filter it, or maybe we we'll want to see one category with two years, or all four years with three subcategories. This is what we use when we're talking about filtering. So the first filter to come along was the report filter, and it's the default. Uh, the next one that came around in Excel 2010 was a thing called slicers, which you see in this display. And the one that's really exciting in 2013 is something called a timeline. So the report filters will let you filter by attributes or hierarchies. Um, you could select only one value in the hierarchy or attribute, or you could do multiple items, uh, and both of those are options you have to turn on and off. This is also available in the rows and columns, uh, but what you have to be aware of is it's not very, a, there's a little filter uh, flask upside down that shows next to the attribute of hierarchy, but it's not very apparent sometimes on your display. So be careful when you use it on rows and columns. And the placement uh, can be confusing because once you have a attribute of hierarchy in the report filter, if you want to put it in a row or column, it actually removes it from the report filter. Slicer is the next cool thing to come around. You can actually link it to one or more uh, tables and charts. It limits what's displayed in the pivot table. Uh, you can format the slicer by changing the name, size, columns, and display uh, features. And the difference between a row filter and, and a, a row fil report filter and a slicer is in the way it is used in the MDX. Um, we, if you have big calculations, some really complicated ca calculations, sometimes a report filter will filter the data before the calculation, whereas a slicer just changes what's displayed after the calculation happens. So if you're using both of those and you have calculations in your queue, you want to spend a lot of time testing it to make sure it doesn't affect those calculations. Some of the options is being able to change the name, another cool filter really for performance reasons. Uh, you might not want to check it, but in the lower right you see a slicer setting option that says hide, hide items with no data. So if you have a dimension that has five values, say five categories, and your data only has three of those categories, the two the two of them have a visual indicator to say they're, they don't have any data, but you can actually check that first item so it will hide that thing completely. Nice thing that came along in 2013 is a timeline. We're going to look at a demonstration of that. Um, one thing, and uh, I blogged about this and there's other uh, MSDN articles about it, um, if the um, key to the date dimension uh, is not the not the right column for our timeline, you may have to go to the value column part of the date dimension in your cube and be sure to select an actual date data type in the value column. Again, I, I blogged about this. You can go to smilingdba.blogspot.com and you can see that article that I, I wrote on it. All right, so let's go back to demos. And we are going to start demoing the, the filters. All right, so we're going to take basically the same. Uh, we're going to build a new one. Let's add a new sheet. And just so I can show this feature, under the date menu, data menu, instead of saying from other sources, we can actually click existing connections. And what that's going to do is it shows us the connections in the workbook as well as a list of others that have been created on this computer. So I'm just able to select the same workbook, we, uh, the same connection that we worked with it in the other sheet of this spreadsheet and start a new pivot table. Again, I'm going to go to the show fields and go to sales summary. First item I'm going to pick is sales amount and on the rows, I'm going to grab a new hierarchy called sales territory. And this is a area with the countries as well as within some countries that have regions. 
So this is our new um, pivot table. And I'm going to put on my columns a month year. So this is an interesting one. Um, and we have it in our cubes um, where we actually combine the month with the year. Um, and the, the reason we do that is, say, for instance, we want to put the date hierarchy as a report filter. So if you see in the upper right in, in uh, cell C1, which um, I'm going to increase that just a little bit. Sorry that I'm not using Zoomit because on this Surface Pro 3, Zoomit disables my mouse. And then I wouldn't be able to do anything. But here you can select, we, we added the date.calendar to the report filter. And the reason I, I put month year on there is if I say if I want to see 2007, and then I try to drag that to my columns, you'll see that it moves from report filter to the columns. So I need something else to display if I'm going to use that report, that um, hierarchy as a report filter. The other reason is if I select two years and I just have the, word, the, the attribute month, then it's going to sum up those two years under January. But in this case, and let me switch these from rows to columns, you'll see why. So now I can get a list uh, of the Januarys. The order is not correct. But I can get a list of the months with their years down uh, the side, whereas before it would do a sum of the month within there. So if I went and grabbed, I'm going to show you the difference here. I just grab month a year and remove month. You see it sums it up for both those years. So it's just something I like to do is to have that additional uh, attribute, a combination of the month and the year in, uh, in our cubes. So let's, um, let's also add, uh, you can add more than one here. We're going to add sales channel. And you'll see it adds additional uh, row in the upper left part of our spreadsheet. And our sales channels are either internet or reseller. So I can click internet and save that. So that's the use of a report filter. Now let's go ahead and add some additional filters with slicers. So I'm going to click in the in the pivot table, go to the design, I'm sorry, the analyze option of pivot table tools, and you'll see an option here for selecting uh, slicers. And it'll show you all your attributes and dimensions. We're going to go to the product, and we're going to cl click category and subcategory. Another nice thing about the slicer, it'll actually take the attributes of a hierarchy and separate them into two separate slicers. So now you'll see the category which will clean this up a little. And you'll see subcategory. And the really sweet thing about this is as I'm clicking accessory, the subcategories filter to the just those accessories. If I click bikes, then I just see the bikes in the subcategory. And if you notice, components has no data at all, so it has a different sort of display. It's kind of like a uh, not as highlighted area of the slicer. So that's the slicer. You can put any of the dimension, hierarchies, or attributes on there. And uh, lastly, we'll look at is a timeline. So I'm going to go back to Analyze, go to Timeline, and it's going to say, OK, I found three date type dimensions. Which one do you want? I want the date. A really nice thing about this timeline now is it's also not connected to the pivot table as far as it being a column. So I'm going to drag this down. And uh, actually, what I'm going to do is get rid of, uh, I can get rid of this um, filter because it's going to no longer be needed now that we have this timeline. So I'm going to stretch it out. And what you notice is it actually picked up the hierarchy within that uh, date.calendar hierarchy. And we'll see that we can display this either with years, quarters, months, or even days. So now, if I wanted January 2008 to December 2008, then I could just use the timeline to grab that. If I change it to quarters, I can go from 2007 to 2009. 
and that is much, much easier to use than a report filter or a slicer for those, um, those filtering capabilities. All right, we'll go back to our presentation, and that is a demo of the three areas of filters that I see used uh, most of the time. The next thing we'll look at is conditional formatting. All right, excuse me a second, I just want to make sure I covered what I wanted to do there. Conditional formatting helps you uh, accentuate the areas of the pivot table or chart that the user of this you know, dashboard or display can focus their attention on. This was a, a something that was added to pivot tables uh, that is just wonderful. It will actually show you uh, based on your, you can actually customize the rules on how these things are displayed. The first one we'll look at is one called a data bar. And if you look uh, kind of in the middle of the screen, you'll see these blue, green, uh, kind of light blue, yellow, red areas. So you, based on the intersection in the pivot table, you can highlight things uh, a certain way uh, as related to things that are related to the category, subcategory, and so forth. With like gross gross profit margin, you can kind of use this green, yellow, red as the percent of the measures. And the last one, um, even though you can build KPIs and the icons associated with them, inside of the analysis services cube, you can even use the data on a pivot table to show some of these uh, icons. And we're going to look at a couple of those. All right, and the, the last thing we'll look at in this demo also, you'll see it in this display, are some uh, sparkline options, and we'll give you a little taste of that uh, as well. So let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. Data, existing connection. And we're going to do some conditional formatting. We're going to show fields in the sales summary again. We're going to pick sales amount. We're going to pick gross profit margin. And if you notice here, the gross profit margin display is larger than the actual percentage shown. So it kind of stretches that column out. If we go in the lower right under values to gross profit margin, there's actually a value field settings option. And I can actually change what's displayed here without changing the actual um, cube itself's name. So now instead of saying gross profit margin, we just have GPM percentage, which helps with display space. And, and space on a, on a dashboard is just so, so uh, very important. So the first thing we're going to do is go find our product categories, and we're going to drag that option down to our row labels. And then we're, we're going to see that when we drill down to bikes, we have subcategories. But when we're up, we have actual categories. So I'm going to go to the first value under accessories and sales amount, go to the home ribbon, and to conditional formatting. We're going to pick data bars, and we're going to check blue. Now, it only added it to that one intersection uh, inside the spreadsheet. So there's a little help that comes next to the right. You roll that down, and you can say either all the sales all the sales that show sales amount or the sales amounts that have a value for category. And we're going to select that. And you'll see that bikes here is our most popular percent of sales amount with components coming in second. Now, what if we drill down into the bikes, that same uh, bar does not carry down. What we have to do is go down to the subcategory, go back to home, format, and this time under data bars, instead of picking the blue, we're going to pick the green so it stands out a little different. We have to roll it down and say do for all subcategories, and now we see that road bikes is our, our uh, higher bike uh, subcategory. Uh, but an, another thing that is interesting is, I'm trying to get rid of that little help there, which won't go away, you'll see the percentages might be different. So even though we had lesser sales in mountain bikes, our gross profit margin is actually larger. So let's go to, to the accessories um, intersection of gross profit margin percent, and I'm going to get in that cell, 
go to home, conditional formatting, and instead of a data bar, this time I'm going to do color scales, and I'm just going to pick the first one, which is going to, I don't have any rules set, but it's just going to determine which is the greatest to the smallest. And you'll see that our gross profit margin on accessories is larger than clothing, then is larger than bikes, then is larger of, than components. So even though the component has red, it's just an indicator within the category of what is our highest and what is our lowest. And we can do the same thing for within the subcategory. We could do a conditional forming scales and we'll just set it to a different, uh, different uh, highlight. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And you can see you kind of get a different little area uh, of display for your subcategories. So that is some conditional formatting that we placed on there. Oh, and the last thing we could do is we can go to Home, Conditional Formatting, and we can go to Icon Set. And we can pick a variety of icon sets. I like these, these five guys myself carry those down to the different gross profit margins. And then we can see kind of an up and down and how those values relate to others. So not only is it available in Excel, but you also have the same option within a multi-dimensional cube. Even with a tabular cube, you can do this. Uh, when you create a KPI, which I'm drilling down into the financial perspective, gross revenue, and there is a status and a trend uh, for um, for the KPI inside of the analysis services queue. So you're not just limited to what you can do in Excel. There's actually some of that stuff built in to the cube itself. All right, so we formatted those two, which look pretty nice. And our last part of conditional formatting is going to be with the spark lines. So. I'm going to click and what the one thing to be aware of is when you put one of these spark lines on your display, it's not going to be within the pivot table. So I actually have to click an area outside of the pivot table, go to insert, and I gotta find my is this my lines, my line here, and it's gonna ask you for uh, an area. Before I do that, what I need to do first is I need to go ahead and get rid of G, GDM, and I need to add a column heading um, for our accessories or for our um, for our category. So I'm gonna move the calendar year hierarchy out there, and now I have a list of values I can draw a line for. And I'm gonna hide my totals. So I'm not interested. Well, we can still show that, and it's not gonna be bad. So I'm gonna go to insert again to lines, select my area, which I'm just dragging it across, and there's my little spark line. Now I can actually drag these down and get a small graph on my display. Now that's the spark line, and there's some options to change it, color, marker color, and so forth, so you can actually highlight uh, different points of it. So you can make changes to these as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab another one just so you can see the three options. I'm going to do a column, highlight the cells again, and then just like you copy and paste inside of an Excel, you can get you can get that out there on the display. So that's a pretty cool little uh, display. I'm going to copy this pivot table. I'm going to paste it below. I'm going to widen the A column, and I'm going to remove the sales amount from this guy. Actually, you know, one of the other things you could do is on a measure, so we have sales amount in a cell, I can actually go to value field settings, and I could change the show value as, pull this up a little, I can change the show value as as a percent of grand total, and then I can see the percentages um, on here. You can actually put the same value multiple times, I'm sorry, the same measure v multiple times in the value section and just change the show as and actually create other measures that you might want to see. Just another little tip. I'm going to take that out though and what I want to see is gross profit margin because here is a negative. So I want to see what I could do to show that negative. One of the other spark lines is called a win-loss. 
And if we go grab win loss, click OK, now you'll see how that little red area goes down, whereas the others are going up. So just another neat little spark line that could be used inside of here shows an up and down um, inside of there. And again, you could copy and paste this down uh, if you want. All right, we'll go back to the presentation. That's some of the conditional formatting that you're able to do um, using the icons, the data bars, and the different color sets that are available. And before we end uh, with our, our dashboard creation, we'll look at charts. Um, a pivot table is able to create charts uh, related to it. It can be bar, line, stack, and a whole bunch more. Um, charts, what you want to do is really um, when, you're, when you select a chart, you need to make sure the data fits it. For instance, that a win-loss doesn't look good unless you have a negative. Um, you always need to answer the question that the business wants. There was a great session at the past summit that you, this past year by Dan Bulos. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Are you getting your message across how to display data? And if you can get online to rewatch some of these sessions, go watch his and he gives some great advice of when and where to use certain charts, pie charts, everything. And he also gives you some websites to go to. Uh, to pick those. So one more demo of that before we do our final dashboard and we'll do a couple charts. Kind of repetitive now, uh, connecting to an existing connection and we are going to get the calendar hierarchy on our rows. Again, I'm looking at sales summary. I'm going to get my sales amount. And I'm going to create a chart with this. So this will be a simple chart. If you go into the pivot chart, go to the pivot, pivot table. I'm sorry, if you go to your pivot table, go to the pivot table tools, and then analyze, you're able to pick a chart. It actually suggested a line, a bar chart for me, so Excel now has some intelligence, and now we have a chart to display. There's a bunch of things you can do here with formatting. Hover over there, you can add chart elements. We can come in here and change our title. We can go to the legend, format that axis, and tell it to display units in millions. Makes it a little bit smaller there. Let me close that guy. Um, also, you'll see you have some buttons out there. You can actually hide all these from the chart. And then to get as much real estate as you can, you can move that legend. Oh, it's not showing me the right thing. To the bottom. Ooh, that's not good. All right. That possibly was going to happen, so just as a backup, I have one done. <laughs> that was kind of crazy. All right. We'll go back to this. I'm a, uh, I am going to go back to my field list. And for now, I'm going to remove gross profit margin. I'm going to try to get my chart back. Live demo, right? Didn't like me changing something. <laughs> we'll go back and hide our buttons again. Move our legend the bottom. Change this legend. Oops. To be millions. And we should have a good display there. So there's our, our chart of those amounts. 
um, if we wanted to add another item, another measure to that chart, go back to sales summary, get gross profit margin in there. Remember how we Sorry about this. Could change the display of it just to make it a little more readable. And now we have two things on here. The problem is, is we don't see the other number. Since it's so much lower than sales amount, what we need to do is change our chart type to maybe a line, some dots on the line, and we'll see that chart is on the bottom, or that line's on the bottom. What we could do is select that, right click, Format data series, and we can make it a secondary axis and see what happens here. Now we have two lines, one's our right axis, one's our left axis. Now they can kind of cross each other there. So I can also go to, say, the dollar value, right click, and change this chart type. And I could change this one to a bar or I'm sorry, a column, click OK, hide that guy, and I lost my, all right, so let's do this, right click, format the series, that's my primary, I just want to change that one to a column. Hmm. All right, well, I'm not succeeding in what I'm trying to do, so we'll move on. But basically, you can put a bar and a line chart in the same hmm, in the same chart. So I'm going to move on from that since it's not working the way I hoped it would do. And let's look at a stack bar. So let's go to a new sheet. We're going to go to an existing connection, click OK, and we are going to add our calendar year as our rows. We're going to do a product category as our column, and we're going to look at sales amount. So since we're cross-joining categories and years, the typical chart might not look good like a bar or a line chart. Uh, one of the other available options is a stacked bar chart. And we'll do 100% and we'll show that. So let me, um, I'm going to go ahead and make this full size. So we can see it. And here you can actually see comparative to each category um, what's, a, uh, what's there, um, the highest level of sales versus the lowest level of sales. I can actually right click on this and there's a thing called add data labels. So I can actually get the label inside of the bar chart itself, which is pretty cool. You could do that for each one of them if you'd like to. Now also on the chart itself, there's a design menu choice. Let you pick some different things uh, to use on that. I'm going to go to this quick layout, and there's an option here that actually shows a table within a chart. I really like this one because now I don't have to show my pivot chart inside or next to the chart. I can make the chart almost full blown and still see a table of the data inside the chart. That is a really neat thing. Um, so that pretty much concludes the um, charting part. And the last thing is, is putting this all together. So here, here's a, um, a good display of everything that we've done so far. And I'm just going to go straight to it um, rather than trying to build this because of time. And I'm going to increase my percent here. So here we got everything except the timeline feature.
but that's okay. And we can use this chart to kind of find things. So for instance, we see some red in different areas. For instance, our uh, GDP, GDM for internet sales is 41%, but for reseller sales, it's 0.58%. So I could come up to my slicer and I could say, okay, I just want to look at reseller sales. And everything adjusts. Now, what I see is um, maybe bikes here has a negative percent. So I come over to my slicer on the left and I select bikes. And now it filters out even further. And then I can see that Pacific had the highest negative uh, decrease. So I can go grab, I believe that's Australia. And now I can look directly at Australia's and I might see that I only have sales for 2007 and 2008. So this just shows you what a dashboard can do to enable a, a user of this information to, to get all the little pieces, put them together and get a display of what actually is gone as well as drilling down to a certain area within their data. So that's putting it all together. And that's really all, folks, and we'll take any questions uh, if you have them. All right, Elizabeth's saying there are no questions, so um, if no one has any questions and you need uh, more information, you can email me at the smiling DBA uh, at gmail.com. You can go to the, my blog, just Google, I'm sorry, just Bing, uh, the Smiling DBA or Thomas LeBlanc SQL Server, and you will get uh, some info. If you email me or post a comment on the blog, I will be sure to answer it. And I really thank everybody for attending. Okay, um, if we're still on, someone said uh, they would like to know some uh, good blogs. Um, I can't think of their name uh, off the top of my head, um, but if you email me, I'll get you that list. Uh, there is one or two Excel experts that are coming to the uh, biz, uh, uh, Business Analytics Conference in Santa Clara. Uh, if you go to their uh, that website, and look under speakers, you'll see their names. I believe one of them has an Excel TV that shows a lot of the stuff that we were uh, looking at. Another question is, does this all work with Power Pivot as well? Yes, it does. Power Pivot really had the original tabular module, and the tabular module, as well as Power Pivot, can use pivot tables in the exact same way. Good question. Though. I see a lot of people using Power Pivot. Um, actually, we got a consultant in our office last week to uh, help us with the multi-dimensional cube, and most of his work he does today is with Power Pivot. He sits with the uh, CPAs and, uh, and accountants, and uh, they just pound through and Power Pivot, create a model, and then try to deploy that model if other people in the enterprise wants it to either SharePoint or to a, a tabular instance, a SQL Server. Another question is, is it possible to deactivate the expand on part of the pivot uh, table? I don't believe you can. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I know even if, uh, if I go show the Excel spreadsheet, I go back to this and uh, when you're in here and you go to that field, uh, take off the buttons, the, the plus buttons, plus minus buttons, even though it still is dis, it still, uh, it doesn't show the plus, if they double click it, it still drills in. And if you right click, you've got to go to the menu to drill back up. So I don't believe there's a way to disable that. Sorry. If I see that there is one later on, I'll be sure to blog about it for you or send out a tweet on where to go.
Hey, if y'all look at that display too right now, this is what I was trying to do earlier where I had the line for the gross profit margin percent as a line and the actual sales amount as a bar. So look, magic happened. <laughs> All right, if, it, if there's no more questions, you ready to uh, close it down, Elizabeth? Oh, one more, okay. We're patiently waiting. See if I have any more of those in here. Is it possible to make pivot table using multiple sources of data? No. You cannot put two sources of data within one pivot table. You can, though, create a data model within Power Pivot that does link up multiple data sources. Um, so the tabular uh, way to join tables in uh, Power Pivot allows you to pull data from multiple sources. This source is just a multi-dimensional cube, so uh, someone that uh, is experienced in analysis services would have to bring those tables together, but Power Pivot will do that for you. And there's plenty of Power Pivot and tabular module um, uh, recordings out there. Go to YouTube, Pragmatic Works. Um, um, William Pearson, and uh, if you have a subscription to Pluralsight, there's plenty out there. I guarantee you can find one on the virtual chapter sites as well. Well, thank y'all all, all for attending. Y'all all in Louisiana is the plural of y'all. In case you didn't know. <laughs>